Do you have a passion for the water or sailing? Today, I'm in beautiful Hilton Head, South Carolina. Check it out. If you're passionate about it, that you really want to do, you've got to surround yourself with people who do that. Find yourself a mentor. Surround yourself with people who are positive. With Captain Rob and his wife Michelle on board the Tears Charters boat. Captain Rob. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me on your boat. You're giving welcome. Giving me permission. How did you start sailing? Like your passion for sailing? Where, where did that all start? Well, I started uh, back in the early 2000s in uh, Cal California. Um, yeah, I, I bought a sailboat and lived in Long Beach Harbor and learned how to sail, learned about my boat and uh, sailed all over the place. Sailed to Hawaii a couple times, all up and down the coast of Baja. Went, used to go to Catalina Island almost every single weekend and uh, I just fell in love with the lifestyle. Yeah, it's, it's an easy lifestyle, right? Eh, not necessarily easy. Um, sailboats aren't, they're a lot of work. Okay. But it's... It's different. It's not work. <laughs> you say it's rewarding. Yes, there you go. There you go. You know, and then, then I, I actually remember the very first day I really, truly felt, I mean, I've always been an ocean person, always been a water person. And when I truly fell in love with uh, sailing in the ocean, I was out on the boat and down below sleeping. And I had some friends with me. I was with some friends and... Uh, I could hear some crazy noises outside the boat down below. And I'm like, what the hell is that? It was noise. And it was, and kind of find out it was whales, whale songs. And I'm like, oh my God, that's so cool. And from that day on, I was just like, I just, and then when I had to move and I moved to Georgia, I've been trying to find a way to get back to the ocean ever since. Right. It's like, you know, it's like that. It's like that Star Trek movie where they're trying to get back to the Nexus. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to get back to my Nexus is the ocean, right. so you, the water. You have such a passion for it that you're going to figure out a way to get there. Right. So, right. 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 And then fast forward a few years, uh, my wife Michelle and I, you know, I was working at a job that, you know, that it was basically was killing me, and uh, and she had an established real estate business up in Atlanta. And as long as I've known her, I've always been talking about, I want to get back on a sailboat. What kind of sailboat would you live on, honey? We, we, every time we'd go someplace where they got a sail, like a uh, place to sell sailboat, sail brokerage, I'm like, you think you can live on this one, honey? <laughs> and trying to get talk her into living on a sailboat. So fast forward a little bit, long, a little bit, and we went to see my friend Will, because we put it on a two to five year plan of what kind of boat we needed to buy, and what we need to do, what steps we needed to do to start a sail charter. And uh, so we're talking to Will and he's telling us what kind of boats and uh, he's even doing drawings on napkins and everything, what, what kind of boat, what we're looking for. And then he says, oh, I know a guy's got a sailboat and a charter for sale. So he, and so Will calls him up and uh, Captain Bill, he was the, he's the, one of the, one of the line, line of owners of this boat. Okay. And uh, he goes, yeah, I sent him down. And uh, so we came and talked to him. We liked the boat. We thought the boat was nice. And uh, next thing you know, the whole thing just kind of fell in our lap. And uh, it was just, she, it, it was just, just it, was, it, it, it just worked out. We just said, okay, everything, every, yeah. And that's, then that's when we sold our house in Atlanta. And we bought this boat and got a place in Savannah. Now my wife's selling historic real estate in Savannah. We're trying to make a name for herself doing that. And uh, I bought the charter and the boat from Bill Pascalusis. And uh, right now I'm just doing the steps, learning these waters. He has basically been a very good mentor. Uh, you know, this she's an old boat, but she's a solid boat. Right. Yeah. So she's got a lot of experience. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and I was going to ask you about that. Like what, like what year 
boat um, and, and her length and any other specifics about the boat that you want to share? Uh, well, this is a 1982 uh, Nelson Merrick Morgan 454. It's 45 feet long and uh, I have a six foot draft and 65 feet on the mast from the water line. Nice. Um, the Nelson Merrick version of these boats, they began like they were racing boats. They, are, they were designed and built to be oceanic racers. That uh, were the kind of boat you'd take if you wanted to race, if you were in a race to go, go over to Europe or something like that, right. across the Atlantic, or to go to Hawaii if you're out in California. This is what type of boat she was. Um, then, uh, then she went into service as a, uh, as a charter boat in, I believe it was the 90s, late 80s, early 90s, something like that. And she's been a charter ever since. And uh, like I said, we don't do any racing with her. And she doesn't go out in the ocean. But we do go out the what's called the Calabogue Sound. And that's uh, about two miles, two nautical miles that way up the Broad Creek. Okay. And that's a nice big open bunch of water. We get close out where you can see the real ocean. Right. But we don't go out in it because... Basically, the Coast Guard has a certified cheers to be an oceanic, ocean-going boat. Okay. So, and you know, it's most people, most people who come on and who who are who come on the boat, they don't have any sailing experience. Right. So, going to the open ocean would probably scare yeah, them really I was, bad. I was going to ask you about that because I mean, I was in the Navy. I've been out in the Pacific. I went swimming around the International Dateline, where there's nothing for hundreds of miles, and it's definitely. A lot different than a swimming pool oh, yeah. or at the beach. So yeah. if you don't have any experience, yeah, you don't really want to go out there and have any troubles, right? Right, right. I mean, have you had any trouble maybe in your experience as a sailor? Is there any time that maybe it got a little bit rough? Oh, yeah. And you, you know. Oh, yeah. It's one of the trips to Hawaii. We got caught in a, uh, we got caught in a really bad storm. And on a boat that wasn't much bigger than this one. And... Uh, Oh yeah, that was that. That was a scary trip. I'm sure that, that was we we were up on uh, up on deck. You had to look up to see the top of the waves. Wow! And we're basically surfing the waves, and then um, and then uh, we had an issue with the halyard line. The halyard line is what pulls the mainsail up and lets the mainsail down. And uh, we had some troubles with that. And I had to climb to the top of the mast to fix that in the open ocean. <laughs> going like this and uh, it was it was pretty crazy splashed in salt water a couple times hey, on the top of the mast so yeah, that was pretty quick <laughs> yeah it was pretty but you take all that in stride right. training to learn from that kind of stuff yeah and i was going to ask you like is there something that you could say you took away from that something you learned i mean obviously don't get stuck in a storm but right <laughs> watch the weather a little bit better the, the noaa and the weather channel are right. your friends <laughs> <laughs> yeah now this is this is basically a fair weather boat um back just the other day we were getting ready to go out and we had customers and i think it was friday i believe it was michelle it was friday right when I was with you. no when the, we had those well, the next day. That was Friday. Anyway, so we had a group of people who were going to go out, and uh, we started to go out, and we got just a little ways, and we started looking at the weather channel, looking at the clouds, and we see these ugly clouds, and they were headed our way. <laughs> and we're like, so we're like, you know what? We're turning right back around, brought it back here, and right about the time we got here, that's when the rain hit, and then it got ugly, and I had to have... My passengers sit down below, and uh, below decks, she needs some cosmetics. <laughs> and uh, so I had to have them sit down there while we rode out the storm. And once the storm passed, you know, this is the south. You know, the storm will come, blow crazy, lightning, rain, torrential rain, then leave 10 minutes later. Right. So they just sat down below for a little while, which is fine with them. They were sat down there and ate their little munchies, and and uh and then we out, went out and we went sailing uh so is that's just you just got to pay very close attention to the weather the tides the winds 
and uh, know what, like if you get a really heavy wind, you're gonna do a thing called reefing the sails, where you don't put out as much sheet as, as you normally would. Right. Uh, on a day like this, we'd have full sails out. Yeah, 13, 14, 15 knot winds, we would probably, we would reef the sails, or we just wouldn't go out, especially if we saw a storm coming. Right. Yeah, you just you, you become very in tune with Mother Nature. Right. Yeah, and like, so I'm sure there's a lot of schooling and training. Oh yeah. That you have to go through because like the ocean, like we talked about, is very unforgiving. So each situation is going to be a little bit different. Oh like, yeah. So you have to be in, in touch with Mother Nature, but how how much training would you say somebody would have to go through before they would even want to start sailing? Like if they're interested in sailing, you know, how would they start? Well, you take, there's the ASA classes, the American Sailing Association, they give classes, and uh, then you crew on a boat, you know, if you have your own boat, you know, you stick close to shore, you know, don't ever get, your first little while, don't ever get further out, then you can see land. Right. Uh, learn your navigation, uh, the other, learn your navigation equipment, have good navigation, radar, sonar, every, everything you need. Uh, know the water, study the charts, and knowing a little bit about celestial navigation, either that or you, or you find some place to pull in or anchor for the night. And uh, that's what you do for your first little while. And uh, then crew on other people's boats and that are going out in the big water. Like maybe you might know somebody who's gonna take their boat to uh, the Bahamas. Right. Get on that boat and learn from them. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of patience. Yes, right? yes, yes. A lot yes. of patience and learning because I know, like, I mean, when I'm teaching my kids something, they want to get to the destination. I want to get there now, you know, and it's like you're talking, like, stay close to the shore. Yeah. Right? you got to learn it because you go out there in the open waters, you're going to get into some trouble really quick. Oh, yeah. And then maybe you will say, no, I'm not really interested in that anymore because that was too rough for me, you know? Yeah, there's a lot of people who don't go in the ocean. Um I, I actually know a lot of people, and here on the East Coast, you have the intercoastal waterway. So, and and most of the intercoastal waterway, you can get a boat this size down. Right. Uh, there's like just a couple places where a boat this size would have to actually go out in the ocean. But uh, you can take the intercoastal waterway, and I know a lot of people who say it's great because you always have some place where you can pull in at night. There's always a marina or some place. Where you, or an anchorage at the very least, where you can pull in someplace, drop an anchor, hook up to a mooring ball, and uh, kick back, relax, have a couple cocktails, make something to eat. And, uh, but when you do where you're out in the open ocean, you really have to, there's no place to pull over. Right. Head yeah. on a swivel then. What? Head on a swivel. Yeah, yeah. Head yeah. Head and, and there's no place to pull over, so you, sh you really should go out in the open ocean with several people on the boat. Right. You know, get a few friends and, and do it that way. That way you always got someone who's on watch. Uh, we got somebody who might be down below, make supper for everybody. Right. And, uh, and then the other thing is uh, you definitely don't want to be drinking. Yeah, yeah it was the, that was the one thing they told me. He says, when you're on the open ocean, he says, don't be drinking. He says, it's the easiest way to fall overboard. Right. And so, but when you do the intercoastal, yeah, you can stop for the night, have yourself a beer. Right. Yeah, so that's, yeah, there's different ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I think it's like 5,000 miles of intercoastal waterway in the United States. It begins up in Maine. Goes all the way down Florida, around Florida, back up the other side of Florida, uh, around through the Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and then down to Texas. And the American Intercoastal Waterway ends in Brownsville, Texas, I believe. So pretty much, I mean, you're saying there's there's so much intercoastal waterway that I mean, you, you really know, don't you need, need to. to. Go out in the open yeah, you know, yeah. Plenty of stuff to see. Yeah, at least at least that's here on the East Coast. On right. the West Coast, is different. You don't have that. So you have to go into the into the big water, but there's enough marinas and things along the way where it's like, okay, well, I'm going to sail for a day, a night, a day, and then pull in at a night. Let's that in Santa Barbara Harbor right. or uh, Santa Cruz or go into the Monterey Bay area or something like that. 
you know, or, uh, but it's all about, you got to study your charts and you get call people who've done it, learn from other people who've done it. Right. Yeah, yeah. but you got to know your charts. Right. So no matter like what anybody does, right? Like you said, uh, you had a mentor, somebody mm -hmm. who's there to kind of guide you. you they're not going to necessarily teach you their experience. They're going to teach you things that they learn through their experience, but you're going to have yeah. to experience it yourself too. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. And you know, you said sailing's it's, it's hard work. So, I mean, obviously if you were in salt water, it's going to take a toll on the boat. Oh yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure there's repairs and, and kind of oh, preventative maintenance and stuff that you oh, got to do all the time. Oh, constantly, constantly. And, and this, this is salt water here on the Broad Creek. This is all salt. This isn't fresh water. And I'm not even sure 100% why they call it a creek because the water doesn't come from anywhere on land. <laughs> it's very tidal. And here, and here in this area, we have anywhere from a 7 to 10 foot tidal range. Oh, wow. And uh, so, but yeah, you just learn from other people. Yeah. And so, like, going along with, like, the hard work, how long does it take? to prep a boat like this if you're going to take it out like if you're going to go sailing you're going to take a tour oh you know oh if i quick. got yeah if i got a if i got a day sail or someone's coming to come sailing i'll be i'll be on this boat a couple hours before they even get here okay cleaning the heads kind of doing my best to straighten out the right. salon area uh scrubbing the deck um making sure the engine's working right checking the oil checking the coolant I run the engine for a little while to make sure the coolant, it, the way uh, the coolant system on a uh, sailboat works, and actually on a lot of boats, especially diesel boats, is that it sucks in salt water, it sucks in raw water from the from the water water wherever you're at, whether it's on a lake or an ocean or wherever. It sucks it in, runs it through uh, a cooling system, a series of pipes, runs it over that. Like on an, a car, your radiator, it works like that, but a little bit bigger and okay. it uses raw water. And uh, you got to make sure that's flowing because you definitely don't want the engine to overheat. And you check the oil, make sure your oil's up. And uh, and then you just, just basically, it's mostly a lot of cleaning. Right. A lot of cleaning. And unless you know how to scuba dive and are willing to jump into the water and clean the uh, bottom of your own boat and then you got to hire so every once in a while you got to hire a, uh, a scuba diver to come clean the bottom of your boat right. yeah we, which isn't too overly expensive and, and I don't know how to scuba dive so <laughs> now what about uh, like somebody that doesn't have any experience sailing any navigation like I know but being in the Navy I know you know starboard side is the right side port side is the left you know green's always right red's always left mm -hmm. I mean do you have any like small tidbits of knowledge that you can share with people that don't have any, maybe something that's interesting, you know, like I think a lot of people think, ah, oh, you just, you just go out in the water, you just start sailing, but there's certain rules, like if you're going to pass a boat or over. Oh yeah. Boat, yeah. You know, the rules of the road. So much involved. Oh you know? yeah. The rules of the road, what they call it rules of the road, rules of navigation. Uh, U.S. Coast Guard calls it the core eggs. Uh, yeah. In order to become a, uh, a master captain of a charter like this, you you have to know the coal regs inside and out, and uh, it's actually quite lengthy. Yeah. Um, but I I suggest taking a boating safety class. If you're not going to do it as a profession, just take your buds out, go a little fishing, go sailing, or whatever. Uh, it it's good to take a, a, a the Coast Guard's safe boating classes. Right. And uh, to learn how to sail, the American Sailing Association, they have sail classes or you can take lessons someplace. I've had several calls of people wanting to go on lessons, and I'm thinking about adding that to the tour repertoire of what we do yeah. next year. Yeah, and so, so as far as like what you do, you do, um, I noticed it's like people, weddings, birthdays, maybe bachelor parties, they mm -hmm. just want to go out and sail for, you know, part of the day or do you have like sightseeing? And stuff that you do also yeah that's what we do yeah uh, we get bachelorette parties we get bachelorette parties bachelor parties they have, have a tendency to spend those in the strip clubs right. yeah. bachelorette <laughs> bachelorettes like to do things like going out on a boat going right. sailing and so like that yeah so we get a lot of bachelorette parties we've got a wedding coming up what in september we got a wedding coming up in september um as a captain i could i could actually marry people 
which I'm waiting for the first time somebody asked me to. That'd be so cool. cool. That'd yeah. be so awesome. <laughs> Mary still be on the water. Yeah, and uh, and, ba and basically that's exactly what we do. Is we take people out. We go right down the Broad Creek River down here, at the, the Broad Creek, and we go underneath the uh, Cross Island Expressway Bridge, and then follow that out to the uh, Calabog Sound. Mm -hmm. And depending on what Mother Nature's telling me, uh, we either can either, if it's the tide's high enough, we'll go through what's called the cut. Uh, there's an area between Brahms Point on uh, Spanish Wales and Buck Island. There's a, uh, there's a place where you can cross there, but you can't cross during low tide. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck there for a while. <laughs> and so if it's low tide, then we'll go on what's called the inside of Buck Island between... Um, between the Calibo K and Buck Island. Buck Island's for sale, by the way. Oh, it, it's 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 a pretty good size island. <laughs> and then we get and then we go. Island with two houses. Yeah, and then we go up to we go up towards Dufuski Island, and uh, kind of by uh, Harbor Town, and then we'll uh, come about and come bring people back. It's, it takes about two and a half hours. You know, of course, if we've got a group of people and everybody's having a blast and we're having fun with them, we may accidentally forget what time it is. <laughs> <laughs> that usually happens on their sunset tours. Oh, okay. uh, on the, during the day sails, yeah, we kind of really do got to get back, especially if I got another sailing that night. Right. Yeah, that, that's the only time we got to really adhere to the time. But uh, if we don't have another sail after that, you know, like I said, if we're having fun, the passengers are having a blast, we're having fun then it, we're, it's not unheard of for us to accidentally stay out an extra right. half an hour or something. something yeah. Something you love, right? Yeah. I mean, why, why rush away from that to go back to the <laughs> daily grind or something? Yeah, yeah. So well, it, it's, been, it's been good so far. You know, I'm not making any money on the boat right now, but she's paying her own bills. Right. So which is actually better than we were expecting. That's good. Yeah. 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 She's paying her own bills, keeping my crew paid. Uh, keeping ice in the ice chest for my crew's uh, drinks, right? For the, their water, and got a few few crew beers for after the <laughs> after the end of the day. The end, yeah, yeah, because we're not allowed to drink. If something were to happen, if you had one, just one beer, right, we'll get your boat taken away and your license gone. Yeah. So yeah, we don't we don't play games as far as that's concerned. Right. Do so you have, do you have any? Uh, I know you said you like sailed Hawaii. Is there like a maybe a certain place, even not sailing, but you visited that it's kind of like your favorite place to go to. Yes. Uh, oh, God, what was the name of that marina? Oh, I got to think. Baja, California. Baja, California. Baja, California. I pulled in this little marina. Uh, I'd have to actually look on the charts to remember what the name of that because this was several years ago. And uh, and it, he, had, it, he had mooring buoys, so he, he had to moor on. And at the time, you know, I had a little dinghy that I carried on my boat. And he went into shore, and uh, oh, people were friendly. The food was just off the chain. You know, seafood that just came right out of the water, right out of the Pacific Ocean that day. Um, and it, it was just, it was a great place. It was just, and a lot of the little marinas and stuff along the coast of Baja are, are, are like that. Um, there's another place uh, that I used to like to go to is uh, Twin Harbors on Catalina Island. That was fun. That was fun. But it's starting to get a lot of, we get a lot of people coming in. But it was mostly a place where sailors went. Right. Where people, you know, either in their motorboats or on their sailboats, that's where they went. The tourists went to uh, Avalon. That's where the tour boats would take people and drop them off in Avalon, and people with their own boats would usually go into Twin Harbors. Right. And uh, so, and that was that was a pretty amazing place. Uh, part of the great the uh, California Great Kelp Forest is right in that area. It's on the leeward side of the island, and which means the waters were fairly clear. And uh, it was really neat. It was really neat. Now, the people that come on the sailboat, and maybe they've had some experience like boating and stuff, is there anything that they, kind of sticks out to them that they tell you about, like going on a sailboat versus just a regular like fishing boat or something that is really memorable to them? You know, like anything like to say, 
you know, I've been out on a on a boat before, but a sailboat, it's so much different. You know, it's oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's quite awful because I always ask people when I go up to go up to the area where I meet meet our groups. Hey, I always ask them, anybody has anybody sailed before? And uh, you know, most of the time it's no or. Oh, I've been on a sailboat or I've been on a catamaran, you know, then I have to explain them the difference between a monohull and a, and a catamaran. And, uh, you know, make sure they know that uh, a monohull sailboat will heel over. Because that's about the only thing that will scare people. So we got to make sure they know that my boat's about ready to do this. <laughs> and uh, you let them know, hey, it's, you know, it is completely normal. That's what they're supposed to do. Right. And and three about two thirds of the weight of this boat is actually in the keel, for that reason. Okay. It is it is really 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 hard to capsize a sailboat. I mean, you actually have to be trying to <laughs> capsize a sailboat. So you're really yeah. good if you can capsize a sailboat. Uh, no, you're really <laughs> stupid. One or the other, <laughs> you screwed up somewhere. <laughs> And, and every once in a while, if, I'm having, if I got people that are having fun, you know, we heal it over. We try to give them a nice level ride and not do too many crazy. But if I got a group of younger people and they're having a good time, I might bury the rail. Right. Which means heal the boat so much over where I have water coming over the, over the edge of the, of the boat. Yeah. And uh, they always get a thrill. And, and if boats heal over and I see one of the, uh, the Hague Point boats, they're actually big uh ferry boats that take people over to Dupuski Island. If I see one of them coming, they make, make a pretty good wake, and I'll head right for their wake, so I can splash some water <laughs> up over the thing. You know, just little piddly stuff, right. have a little fun. Um, but most of the time, we try to keep on a pretty even keel. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible on a sailboat to be completely straight unless, you, unless you're on a downwind run. Uh, yeah, you put it into a point of sail where you just you got the wind coming directly from your back, and uh, then you put the the sails out, and you got a nice level, smooth ride that way. Hmm. But when you when you're uh, on what's called a close haul or a close reach, uh, the boat's going to heal because then you got the wind coming from that direction off the bow of the boat, coming from that direction, and. Uh, and it hits the sails. You got to keep the sails at forty-five degree, about forty-five degree angle to the uh, to the wind. Hmm. And you know, it's little things like that is yeah. what you got to learn when you go when you sail. Yeah. And if you put her into the wind, then you're gonna stall. You're not. If you pull her in fully in the wind, you're gonna stall. Yeah, because I mean, I, I mean, I don't, I've never spent any time on a sailboat and don't know the, I guess, the aerodynamics and everything of it. But I think a lot of people would think that it's gonna work where it's actually pushing into the sail, right? And that's not the case? Well, the wind's going into the sail, but it works like an airplane, uh, Benoli's effect. Yeah, Benoli's effect. Right. Where it, you're, you're, the wind's not actually pushing you. It's creating suction. And so you're being sucked along right. the wind. And, yeah, you fill the sails by having them at a 45-degree angle max, and unless you're at full broad reach, which is I got one, yeah, I got the sails way sticking out off the beam. Or, uh, or what we call wing on wing, which is we're one of the few boats that will do it. Who, who we've got people who are skilled enough to do it because it's real dangerous to do it. <laughs> but uh, so we got the, uh, the main sail out one side and the head sail out the other side. And that, that would be the closest to what you think where the wind's actually pushing you. Right. Yeah. And then if you get a good following tide, you know. Your, the tide's going in the same direction you are, the wind's going in the same direction, you can actually get scooting right along. Uh, but, the exciting, but the exciting sailing is when the boat's all heeled over, yeah. water's coming over the edge. And uh, but it can be really neat. Now, for like maybe the younger audience that's watching, do you have any advice for, say, somebody that has a passion and they're just not sure like what to do. I mean, like, you know, you have a passion, you wanna kinda take some steps toward following it, but sometimes people are like, eh, you know, I don't know if I should do that, you know, just, they don't have any, uh, maybe afraid of what other people are gonna think. And what would your advice be to somebody 
screw other people. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. You know, everybody, when we start saying, hey, we're going to buy a sailboat, quite a few people thought we were nuts. I'm sure. And what I used to tell people is like, yeah, it helps. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really does help to be a little bit nuts to sell your home in Atlanta and buy a sailboat right. and There's a sail charter business. So much, right? Yeah, well, like, but we yeah, love doing yeah. it and we're actually able to earn a little bit of a living. Right. Um, and, but just do it. Right. I mean, just do it. Find yourself a mentor. Find yourself someone who, who does what you want to do and Follow them around like a lost puppy dog. Yeah, I and think just that's a do big it. one, right? Having yeah. a mentor. Because everybody, yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter what you do and what level you are, you're always going to need kind of a mentor or a coach to kind of. Yeah, and you got to and you got to have patience because it's right. like, you know, like say a lot of kids today, they think that, you know, oh, I'm going to learn how to play guitar. And they get frustrated because after a year of guitar playing, they're not famous and making bajillions of dollars. Right. You know, yeah. and they still right. suck at playing guitar. No, it's practice, practice, practice. You know, like that old saying goes, which way to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. That's right. And because uh, I played guitar for a long time. I still play guitar. And I started when I was eight years old. By the time I was uh, 15, 16, I was actually able to make money. But it took that many years right. to do that. And you had to learn how to read and write music. So I was able to make money as a session guitar player. But uh, yeah, you learn. You gotta learn learn the craft of what you want to do. Right. You know that's the number one thing. You have passion for it, but if you don't learn how to do it, then you know your passion is only what like ten percent, ninety percent of it's sweat. Right. It's yeah. just sweat equity. How much are you willing to put into it? What are you willing to do to do this? Right. What are you willing to give up to do this? Are you gonna give up your, your house? Your, 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 your house, yeah. Right. Are you willing? Are you willing to give up uh, playing video games? Right. Sitting and playing video Maybe games with your friends, buds, right? Because I mean, if there's friends that are not following your passion yeah. and dream, and you're like, "Hey, this is what I want to do," and get rid of the naysayers, right? Get rid of the naysayers, and uh, yeah, because you can't. If you got everybody in there, oh man, you can't do that. Oh man, you can't get. Guess what's going to happen? You're not going to do that. Yep. You're absolutely so right. you hang out with people who do what you're wanting to do, whether it's music sailing uh cross-country motorcycle riding right you know or even building hot rods or being a mechanic or whatever it is that you passionate about that you really want to do you've got to surround yourself with people who do that find yourself a mentor surround yourself with people who are positive and and uh, like will help you along the yeah, way support you. yeah yeah yeah, you gotta get rid of the naysayers. That's awesome advice. Now, if somebody was visiting Hilton Head and they wanted to go on a tour, what's the best way to contact you? Maybe through your website? Through the website. Uh, we want on Facebook, Instagram, and right now, until we get it ironed out, uh, phone us. Okay. You just phone call us. And the number is 843. 843- Six seven one one eight zero zero. Okay, cool. And then I, I think it's cheerscharters dot com. Yeah. Right? Yes, that's another way. They could probably mm-hmm. Google. I'm sure they're going to find you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I, I have, you kind of spoke about kids, and my kids will love this one. I have one last question for you, and that is, what keeps a dock floating above water? Uh, uh the uh, pontoons. <laughs> Peer pressure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, the guy I used to work for, I think he sent me that exact. <laughs> exact. Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> I think it was your Instagram. Said, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Captain Rob, thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely.